Today we do, we start the season of Advent, uh, but we're ending a series um, on a, a local teaching where I was teaching first in that first week how God is calling us uh, to come to him and to rest. And that's because oftentimes in this life we can be busy and we can keep running up against things and we don't leave space for rest. And uh, so first God calls us to him and just to remind us that it's okay, we can rest in his presence. That's a good place to be. Uh, week two, uh, I, I reminded us and, and the teachings reminded us that Jesus is calling us into community. We're called to encourage one another internally in the church. We're meant to encourage other believers, help them when they fall down in their walk with Christ when they're trying to do something, but also encourage them when we see them doing things well. And then week three, I was going to teach on healing and how Jesus calls us together to be healing for uh, each other in the community and how Jesus gives healing to us as individuals. But uh, we listened to Laura Jory and her experience last week as we did that. This week, we're going to dive into what God is calling us to do in the world as individuals in the body. Uh, we just heard this story. Uh, Jesus calls us out to be life for our neighbor we heard that story for the kids, and we're going to touch on that. But let us pray that Jesus would open our minds and our hearts uh, today to his word. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this presence, the presence of your spirit. Today we let a candle of hope, a reminder that your son came and lived amongst us. He did great things. He taught us how to live. And he died and he went away so that we could have your spirit with us always in all places. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to each person that hears this message today. I pray first that they would know your love. Second, they would feel as though they belong in community with you. And third, I pray that they would have the courage to do those things that you are calling them to do. Amen. All right. First Peter 3 verse 15 says, worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if somebody asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. We do that by loving our neighbor, by bringing the love of God out to others, by sharing what God has done for us, what Jesus did for us, so that other people can encounter God. More and more as I walk the Christian life, I found that my job as a Christian, even, yes, even as a pastor, is to get out of the way so that people don't see me, but instead they encounter Christ. My job as a Christian is to get out of the way so that people can encounter God in their life, the Holy Spirit, and what that's, what the Holy Spirit is calling people to do, the healing that he is calling them to, the life that he has for them. But what slows us down from doing that? I know for me, early on in my walk, it was feeling like I wasn't equipped for it. I was like, well, don't I have to go to school? Don't I have to get a degree? Sometimes we do good in the world, or sometimes maybe we are giving it quietly, like we're just secretly giving to a charity or to this thing. But we don't dig deeper. We don't, you know, follow God's prompting to build a relationship with a neighbor that might be in need. We don't reach out to people in the local community to help other people who aren't as well off as us. We don't empathize with those in pain on the other side of the world feels like there's barriers to that. For some of us, it could be an embarrassment about our faith. We think, okay, well, if I'm supposed to be this, like, good person, but maybe I haven't done the good things in my life, and I'm a little bit embarrassed that people might call me out for the way that I've lived, that could be you. Maybe you, like me, are stuck in your qualifications. Or maybe you're looking at somebody in need, and you're thinking, that person needs way more help than I could ever give them. Maybe so. But God might want them to have a relationship with you as well and not just with him. Sometimes I think we can't see the good in others and that is what keeps us from helping 
them, from empathizing with their experience. Maybe something in our life causes us to think, well, people like that, they don't really want help. They could do so many things on their own. Maybe we've judged them so much that we can't see that the image of the creator rests on them as well. Other times, I think we feel dry and used up without much left to give ourselves. Maybe one of those resonates with you. Maybe you've got some other reason why it's hard to share. And today I want to read a passage from uh, the Old Testament in Ezekiel, chapter 37. And it's a kind of more like a Halloween passage than a Christmassy passage, but we're going to read it today anyway. I'll give you a chance to turn there. Again, Ezekiel 37. We're going to read verses 1 to 10. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth amongst them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together. Bone to bone, I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into the, these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Ezekiel was a prophet. These are people that have been given a message. Jesus gave a great commission to those early disciples to go out into the world, share his love, the things that they'd been taught. He told them to go and prophesy. God gave them a message God has given us a message. God has given you a message to give to the people. The book before this uh, is a, the book of Jeremiah. And it's also a prophetic book. Uh, Jeremiah was also a prophet. But there's a juxtaposition in these two books. You see, Jeremiah was a prophet of the empire of Jerusalem, the kingdom before exile. And God sent him with a message to the people and said, repent, and this is what will happen if you don't listen. But Ezekiel is a book from exile. What does that mean? It's a book when Israel didn't have much hope, like this candle we've got lit in here. They, they might have that kind of a hope, a, a promise of something yet to come, but they don't feel like any good things have happened lately. And then this, this, this book comes a call, a call to be faithful, to keep having hope in God's original promise. And who was Ezekiel? 
Ezekiel himself was a priest. We read even in the kids' book today about the priest. He was the first one to go by, and the priest didn't help out this injured man on the side of the road. Ezekiel himself was a priest. He had to stay clean as well. But he was called from his priestly role, which would have had very distinct boundaries and lines and things that you do and don't do, to become a prophet because that's what God called him to. And so now Ezekiel is a prophet, a prophet of hope. This is a, a quote from John, John Tullock in the Old Testament story. He says this, Ezekiel became a prophet of hope, trying to prepare the people for their return to the land. You see, when you're living in exile, sometimes it's hard to live by the traditions and the things of your community, your culture. Those things can fall away. If you have a community that's built on God and this promise of hope, and yet you're in exile, you may not feel like it. You may forget the promises that God has made. Ezekiel was there to remind the people, to say that even now, even as it seems that the nation is dead, even though they're scattered, even when it seems like they couldn't bless others, just when it seems that they weren't blessed, God reminded them that nothing had changed but their address. He reminds them that he's going to gather them again to fulfill his promises. But you also have to know this uh, about Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel was a weirdo. He was not a traditional orator. Um, he wouldn't just get a soapbox and stand on it, repent for the day of the Lord is coming. No, he was the drama kid. He was the kid that was always disrupting the class. Like he was, if you're following along and you know the Enneagram, he was a number four. He's like, I am absolutely the most unique person on earth. I'm wearing uh, pink pants and a bright green uh, Grinch colored sweater and I love my life because nobody else would dress like me. That's who he is. He draws attention to himself. He acted out his prophecies in the street. Think about that for a minute. What did we just read? Dry bones. Can you see it? Can you see this prophet, this priest, this person that had a role that people would have known in the community, just like on the floor, shaking these dry bones, moving with, he probably had bones with him. Were priests allowed to touch bones? They weren't even allowed to touch injured, like, people for fear that they might die and you'd become unclean. Dry bones were definitely an unclean thing. Man. He dragged it around. He caused a scene. He'd be the perfect person to have around on a bank heist because people would be like, look over there while I get away with murder over in this direction. You could not miss him. It would have been painfully obvious to everybody that was around. He meant he couldn't worship. It meant that you were cut off from God until you had made the appropriate sacrifice. Here, before Jesus, Ezekiel is showing the people that maybe God's promise and the hope of God were bigger than they'd imagined. Here, in this space, he forces himself to become unclean, to tell the people that God was the person that made people clean in the end. Not their sacrifice, not their action. It was God's breath. The strongest connection back into recreation. You see, breath, the word that is used here in Ezekiel, ruach, that's the Hebrew word, ruach. The same word from Genesis 1, ruach, the breath. God instructs Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath, to the ruach, and he shows him that God will bring it. He didn't say Breathe the life into them. He said, prophesy. But we know even more of the story than Ezekiel did. We live on the other side of the cross. Romans 8, 11 reminds us that the same spirit that raised God from the dead, God's spirit rests in us. Now we don't just prophesy. We're invited to share the breath, to speak God's breath through us of spirit with the world. John 20, 21 to 23 from the message says, Jesus repeated his greeting. 
peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I sent you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? And then in Matthew 6 and 15, also from the message. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Jesus didn't just forgive sins, and he didn't just heal or meet physical needs. The two went hand in hand. They merged. And as Jesus' body, our call to go, breathe life, to forgive sins, to speak the truth, and to be prepared to answer for our faith, the faith that brought us here, we are called to tell them of their great value. We are called to go out to our neighbor and remind them. We tell them about the source of our love, but first we need to love them, and it's hard. That's why we had to come together to encourage each other, remember? That's what these groups of people of other Christians are for. And it's why we have special leaders like uh, myself and we have other compassion leaders in our community. And, you know, we're looking to build a compassion team of people in our own church body. Hear me? (laughs) We're looking for people that are interested and feel like God has called them to listen for our broader church body, the people that aren't just in this space, but that are connected with us online, and say, what is God calling us to do as a body? That's why God gives us spirit. He gives it to empower us and lift us up on wings like eagles, so that even when we run from the things that he's called us to, even when we join in and somebody doesn't get better, even when we get hurt, when we're trying to do the things that God has called us to, we don't get weary. Because God is right here with us, breathing that life into us, even as we prophesy it to others. Because God's Spirit invites other people to prophesy about the life for you as well. Those people are still being called to cry out for you, listen, listen, Listen for God's voice through them. And that community, that community of sacrifice and blessing is what the early church was all about. We sacrifice ourselves as they sacrifice for us. Acts 2, 46 to 47 says this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Enjoying the favor of all the people? Could that be said about the church in Canada? Do all the people favor the church in Canada? What about us? Do they all favor Sandbanks? Do they all favor you in your individual home? Of people outside the church, all people, of people who didn't know Jesus, why? Why did all people favor them? Because they prophesied to the breath, because they brought healing, because they kept going back to the source of their love, their strength, each time it got hard. God. God's spirit, Jesus, his sacrifice, return to the center. Don't try to blend in with this world, hiding behind your doors because you're afraid, afraid they might find out you're a believer, that you believe in a better tomorrow, that you believe that Jesus died for everybody. Don't be afraid that you don't know enough or don't have the right skills. Bring what you do have and allow God to use those gifts with his strength. God wants to use you to bring life. Let me say it again. God wants to use you to bring life. 
We're called to steward creation in the beginning. Remember, the world is a valley of dry bones. We walk through that valley of dry bones, and God is asking us if we think they can live. We, like Ezekiel, have to answer, will we prophesy? God's asking you to prophesy. He's asking you to go into dark places and bring light and life, to bring the breath, the ruach, the power of creation. What will you do? Maybe you think blending in is okay, you're, you're new, you're still learning more about Jesus, that's great. Maybe you're trying to do church on your own at home and it's a struggle to get out. You know, you can't just do that. If you stay home, if you don't prophesy in this world, if you don't share what your encounters with Christ out in the world, of dry bones, you deny the breath that has been breathed into us, into you. And if that's the case, maybe we need to recognize that the best the world can offer, the best this other option if we don't prophesy, the best it has is dry bones, is a dry and lifeless existence. You were dead in your sins, and Jesus saved you from that to do what? To go and prophesy. Do you really want to go back before you encountered life, before you were given the breath? Do you even want to pretend that you don't have the breath anymore? Do you want to pretend that you're the same person you were before you encountered Christ? Will you prophesy or remain silent? Will you go and breathe life or will you try to hide amongst the dry bones? Will you share the life of Jesus with others or deny it for all? Don't hide it or blend in. Jesus kept saying, don't be afraid. That's for us. The Spirit is with us. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear cause you to deny the life that God is inviting you and others into. So as Jesus asked then, I ask now, who is your neighbor? I can't answer that for you. Who is God calling you to prophesy to, to the life. Maybe it's a grocery card for somebody on your street that just lost their job. You can give them the resources and the bandwidth so they don't have to worry about what the food is on their plate next week. Maybe it's shoveling snow for the neighbor because you know they work on call and that will give them time to be with their family. Maybe it's reaching out to the elderly neighbor whose spouse passed away this Christmas season, inviting them to the table so they don't have to be alone. Where are the dry bones of this world wearing down the people around you? Where can you step in to prophesy to the life? Can you create space for them to hear God? Our job isn't to build that sinew it isn't to grow the flesh. Our job is to tell the story, our story, to prophesy to the life that is possible with God. We can point to our healing, and we can bring a peace of God's peace with us to help remove the static, the white noise from their life that's keeping them from hearing God so that the king can bring life. I said already, like, right now we don't have a compassion uh, team. This would be a people that would help us to, like, find uh, mission partners, you know, to help us determine, you know, how do, we, um, how do we grow in this together? How do we listen as a body to find those things that God is calling us to? Is it partnership with food banks, with uh, women's shelters, homeless people? If any of those things, or if you know of other... Um, broken pieces of justice for us locally or us as a nation in Canada and you feel challenged by God to say maybe we can do something more as a body I'd encourage you to reach out to me but I also want to remind you you know we're the meeting house sandbank we're part of this extended family there's another community that is also calling us and challenging us uh, to to more uh, one of the partners that we do uh, as a bigger and broader church community is 
we actively partner together with Compassion to target specific um, geographies and cities and regions. Um, over 10 years ago, I myself sponsored a child uh, in Maposa in Africa, and um, we're going to be watching an update here in just a moment. And uh, it's just a call to action to remember that, like, God is doing this work all around the world. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of resources where we are. We're a church body that is called to be faithful. And sometimes that faithfulness is giving of our resources so that other people can have bandwidth. You know, when you sponsor a child, uh, and then we sponsor a child as a community, what it does is it gives them bandwidth to not worry about food, about their health, about education, and instead to be able to build a healthy life that has space, space for them to be able to hear the voice of God. So let's just tune into this uh, update, and then I'll be right back. Yeah, th we will, um, my email tomorrow uh, with the link for this teaching, and that will have a link for this. Uh, you can go there, themeetinghouse.com slash compassion, and select World Vision uh, if you are going to give online through that. Um, but are you interested in compassion, in looking locally at things that we can do um, together as a body and finding ways not just to you know, encourage us as a body, but to create spaces where we can encourage other people in our community, fundraisers, events, things that they can come to to partner in to be a light in the world to other people that are in need. Uh, talk to me and uh, just pray about it this, this coming week. Because we're called, you know, we need to come together so we can hear what God is calling, not just us as individuals, but how he's calling us to prophesy together, to bring life in ways we couldn't do before on our own. I'd just like to pray uh, for this hope and remind us that, you know, this hope is coming all throughout uh, the Bible. I mean, if you read the Rhyme Bible, there's lots of hope in there. Uh, but you're a big person Bible too. Lots of stories of hope. In the beginning, God breathed life into us so that we could steward all of creation with him and partner in bringing life out there. In Ezekiel, we hear in the Old Testament, in this book where we often think of, you know, it's juxtaposed with death and murder, and it doesn't sound a lot like Jesus, but here, prophesy to the life of God and the hope. Let's remember the hope that we were made in and that Jesus came to remind us of, and he died so that we could live in. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your creative spirit that visioned all of this, and made it. You made us in your image, and we give thanks for that. Pray that today you would remind us of the breath that you breathed into us, even if we are feeling dry and dusty. And if we're afraid, I pray that you would give us courageous and bold hearts to go where you are speaking to us. And I pray that you give us ears that would be able to hear you so that we could go. I pray that you would show us the people that you have put around us who are prophesying to us so we can see those examples as we go to prophesy to others. Help us, Lord to do far more with you than we could ever do on our own. Amen.